And okay, we're now live broadcasting another Tech Talk. Um, actually, our last Tech Talk of the quarter because we were not paying attention to the calendar closely enough when we made our schedule this month. So we had one scheduled for next week and I don't think anybody's gonna be around for that. So we're gonna save that one for April. Uh, so this is the last one for uh, March. And we are talking about contract cheating. Yeah, and I guess I'll take it away. Um, thank you all for joining us on a nice Tuesday of finals week um, for a topic that's probably a little close to home for a week like this, but possibly uh, we're going to be discussing contract cheating. And I think our working definition for today is going to be any uh, service or third party that for, um, you know, for a cost, provides an unfair advantage to students. And what that could mean is, say, a site that uh, shares resources that a student might have pulled from your course, like exams, quizzes, potential essays, or it could be a site that offers to actually make your essay for you. Like there's all sorts of things. And, I mean, the history of it, obviously, I think we all kind of remember back in the day, those pens that had a little extendable parchment that you could write down your equations and answers on. And now it's just kind of become more sophisticated as we've gone into the world of web 2.0 and beyond. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's kind of our, our focus today. And I'll be going through some examples, some exemplars, um, basically the big hitters, I would say in this realm, but also kind of how a student might end up here. We, we did some research and kind of put ourselves in those shoes just to kind of see what might cause someone to do this or uh, what might in some cases be a predatory practice that brings people in. And so kind of starting on that foot, I'm gonna share my screen. We're just gonna kind of go through, like I said, that student experience. Um, and we'll be starting with, say something pretty innocuous that a student types into their Google search bar, how to write a paper, for instance. If we look, and for those that aren't potentially as um, connected to the internet or use Google very often, you know, we have ads as the first thing that pops up. That's Google's mm -hmm. business model. The first two of that are contract cheating websites. They're write my paper for me, 600 plus experts. Um, write my assignment, get a unique essay in three hours. And those and are the first two things that when somebody's just trying to see a place to start on an essay, yeah. That's what they get. That's the part that blew my mind a little bit is the search prompt that you typed in is 100% innocent. How to write a paper. That is a search term from a student who is trying to write their own paper. And the first two things that they see on Google are services offering to write a paper for them. And obviously this isn't unique. This is just something that came to mind that I would have searched when I was in college. I'm not a great writer. Mm -hmm. One of my anxieties, type it into Google. And lo and behold, if I have the money, I could pay for somebody to do this. And I will say, I haven't even heard of these two sites. There are tons that are more popular that do the same thing. Yeah. They all promise these great things, 100% plagiarism free, that kind of element. So you could see how a student searching on Google might stumble upon something like this. Yep. And then for the next example, I was um, continuing in that vein, you know, how to how to write or how to study for an exam the night before. Say somebody, you know, procrastinated or, or maybe they just were looking for some final tips. Mm -hmm. I found this, this website, Oxbridge Essays. Oxbridge, that sounds pretty fancy. Yeah, it sounds legit. But yeah, you know, okay. And oh, look, some top 10 study hacks for the night. You know, it's in a format that you see a lot of um, social media posts in, a lot of news websites now. And these first tips are pretty good. Get some sleep ahead of time. Uh, read your book ahead of time. And then, oh, wait, what's after number five, the examiner? Oh, revise the smart way. Oh, what does that mean? <laughs> right, our, with our model exam answer service, an expert academic specialized in your subject area will provide you with a model answer. So what we've essentially stumbled upon is a site that's created a what seemingly legitimate article for a student. And then they put in little pieces, little breadcrumbs to bring you to their services. What this site actually is, it's a contract cheating website. It's, we'll write your essay, we'll provide you answers to questions, um, 
you know, I, I'm not sure what the turnaround time is on it, but I know a lot of these sites say, oh, in half an hour, we'll get you an answer. And that could be, mm -hmm. you know, somebody's taking a test and they snap a picture of it and send it off to Oxbridge Essays mm -hmm. or unemployedprofessors.com, mm -hmm. which is a real site. Yeah. <laughs> it's not yeah. just something I pulled out of my ears. Um, but, you know, you can see that they've, essentially it, it feels very predatory and that's the word we keep kind of coming to is a student might be just going about their normal business and I'm, I'm talking about you know a typical student trying to find resources google's the answer to everything these days and now they've stumbled upon potentially something that they could get roped into without really understanding the consequences and this is just one example so i i, I shared that to kind of hopefully portray that, you know, it's not always uh, a student trying to do something that is intentionally academically dishonest. Though, of course, you know, those, eventually they're instances. making, and they're eventually making that decision to take that yeah. extra step. But this whole industry of cheating for profit is very carefully constructed to lead them to that point. Exactly. And I'll bring up one, one last example from Chegg, which if we have time, you know, that's a, an exemplar I would, I would say is super common. Um, we have this uh, math calculator. Okay, you know, for $10 a month, I can input math expressions and I could get the answers. Okay, I, I, I would say for a math course, that could be pretty detrimental to my learning. But at its core, there are some equations that I imagine you probably teach a student how to input correctly into a calculator. So, okay, maybe that's not the worst thing we've seen. If I start to scroll down, okay, oh, I can upgrade it. I can try it for three, I can, for free, for three solutions a day, little things to kind of pull me along. But then I start to go down a little bit more. Oh, here's some example math equations. Oh, maybe I'm studying for a math test and I want to see some example equations. But this is where I found it kind of take that next leap. Take a picture, and then we will show you step by step what to write in, you know, say an assessment that requires you to show your work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What initially would have looked like a potential study tool is now obviously being marketed as something that you can cheat with. And they again, never they're, overtly say it. That's the thing. They are being very careful in their language. It's a study guide, it's a tool it's examples, but they know full well that students are using these tools purely to do the work for them, especially in this case where it's writing out the, the steps of the process. Of course, that's what the student wants is somebody to give them the answer and give them the work that they can just copy into their exam or their homework or whatever. Yeah. And Jennifer just gave a great example. iStore has a $60 math app where you can just send in a photo of the problem. And I will say that model, I, I, that's what kind of Chegg is built on. Um, they've kind of started to go to legit, so we're not going to spend too much time about them. You know, they've got their textbook resource where they rent out textbooks for way below market price. And that's obviously something and that we care about equitably. And they're opening, openly partnering with textbook publishing companies, which is kind of... Well, yeah, there's that. That, that bothers me like even more than a lot of this because it feels as though the textbook industry is complicit with the cheating industry, that it's all part of this educational industrial complex that is really just monetizing it on both ends. It's monetizing it on the textbook side where the students are paying for the material. And then it's turning right around and monetizing the work side where, oh, well, we'll just, you bought the textbook. So why don't you just buy us to do the work for you too? Yeah. It, it's super sketchy. The whole thing feels really gross to me. And I will say, um, though I bring up Chegg, uh, the actual user interface for a student. So I created a student account in Chegg. I uh, looked for some of our courses at SS SCC and SFCC, and there really isn't a huge presence, um, student presence, presence in this space. It is very difficult to find, say, exam materials. All I could find is flashcards. It looks like they kind of stripped out a lot of material. That isn't to say that there aren't students sending pictures yeah. to Chegg's 
They've got Take Study, which is basically you have access to a tutor right. that you can send photos to and they'll answer your questions. It seems like Chegg is trying right. to go legit. It's trying to clean up its image and its reputation, partnering with legitimate companies to, I, I assume they have decided that they can make more money that route than just purely being an illegitimate cheating company. So, you know, there are problems with it, but for our institution, the pressure, it doesn't seem is coming from here. And that brings me to Course Hero. This is the one that I would say is the most user-friendly for individuals trying to cheat. It is the most uh, user-friendly for uploading your uh, materials. It is all of those elements. Chegg, you have to snap a picture, you know, it has to be approved. There's a little bit more of a process, more paywalls, all sorts of elements that would get in the way of something like this. So what I did was I signed up for an account with Course Hero, curious to see what it was like. I'm actually gonna pull up my emails from the first about 48 hours of having Course Hero. So let's do this. So here's kind of the first one. Add a course, get an unlock. I haven't even logged in yet. And now they're already telling me, add a course that you're in and get the ability to unlock a, a material. Okay, maybe that's not so bad, but what happens when we start? Here, let me close the rest of this out so it's a little bit cleaner for you. <laughs> Ignore the folder title. Um, feeling stuck, don't forget to use your rewards. Uh, you have five tutor questions, and that's that post a question, get an answer. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's quite a bit of a start. Um, maybe that's something that I might get reliant on as a student, but mind you, this is first 48 hours. They're just setting these back to back to back to back. Mm -hmm. These are the ones I didn't delete, by the way. I didn't quite realize what was happening until a little bit later. I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to save some of these. Mm -hmm. um, so already they're trying to get me using the system. Oh, must-haves, what are these? Oh, these are materials. These are actual materials on Course Hero. Now I did click through all of these and they were not materials from any institution that I had aligned with in that profile, but I hadn't been in yet and they were already sending me a ton of stuff. So uh, let's look, oh, we've got a quiz. Oh, we've got a, a final exam. We have, we have pretty, pretty big materials showing up in this you know, fictional student's inbox. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, if that's not tempting somebody, like, I don't know what is, that's, that's a trap almost. It is. Um, so that kind of brings me to, okay, somebody jumps into that space. Oh, look, get free access by uploading your study materials. So the thing that Course Hero is built upon is a community of sharing. But what that end up, ends up looking like is you share something and then we'll give you something in return. So if you can't pay, well, why not upload, I don't know, a quiz from your instructor or uh, an essay that you did or, you know, one of these things. So they're definitely trying to kind of get you going and build up their platform through our students. Um, oh, you know, hey, Christopher, thanks for, uh, for your thoughts. But that is the homepage of Course Hero. I haven't even logged in yet. I haven't made an account yet. First thing it says, upload your own resources. And then we've got plans, you know. Oh, if you want to ask 40 tutor questions. So that could be theoretically 40 essays. That could be theoretically 40 questions in a big test. You would have those options. And then you'd still have the ability to get more by uploading more. So what I wanted to kind of do is one, describe kind of how this system works. It's very, it's a cycle. Once you get started in it and if it become, you become reliant on it, it'll try to keep you in there. So as an instructor, if you jump to Course Hero, this is what'll come up first. You click on the home page. I'll see if it'll push past, there we go. Sometimes you have to double click because it won't move you if you don't want to. Oh, hey, look, upload more documents. It's just this constant stream of these communications. I'm going to click no thanks for now. Um, but this is what the student homepage looks like. But as an instructor, you don't actually have to have an account to be able to search for your materials in this space, which the same reason it's really easy for students to share and find things, 
makes it a lot easier for us to find our own content. Um, so right now I'm in the student view. You can kind of see any courses that I've attached. I created a fake education 600 course um, just at the falls. They're not checking any of these. I, I just I did that. I uploaded materials and it was that easy. Um, so maybe let's start with how students are uploading and then we'll talk about how to find your materials and get them taken down. Um, so if I'm a student, I can go to earn and I can go to upload documents and all a student has to do is add a document and all course here does is it just checks to see if it hasn't been plagiarized. It's kind of the same check that turnitin.com might do, but less sophisticated. So for this example, this was a, an old assignment I did for a certification. Uh, I uploaded it and it was accepted within an hour. Mm -hmm. um, this one, I took an article that Course Hero had done and I copied and pasted all the text that tried to upload that and they denied it because it was a duplicate. So if it's on their site or if it's on Google being indexed, you can't upload it. So they're trying to at least mm -hmm. have some control over that. Sure. Though I did see that some um, enterprising students on this site had just uploaded complete gibberish, like absolute <laughs> gibberish. Just as a way of getting those free unlocks. Yeah. So it isn't to say there aren't and people another, gaming the gamers. Well, and enough, yeah, game if I gamer is the thing here. Another thing I really hate about this page is it is gamified. It has this little progress bar, a little unlock icon, and it says, oh, you just need to upload nine more. It, it is using these gamification elements as a way to increase engagement, which that's what gamification is for. It can be used for good things to increase student engagement, but in this case, they're using those techniques and this service to, again, hold the student in and keep them in mm -hmm. that system for as long as possible. And I will note something. Uh, Linda Keyes said, what do you think of their appeal to faculty? And um, I know, I, I think Chegg does this too, mm -hmm. but I know Course Hero is trying to get instructors to be part of their program. Now, I don't know if they specifically pay instructors for their materials or things like that, but I know there's an instructor at the University of Washington, he's got some associate dean title, um, that says, oh, you know, I, I put, you know, these practice exams or 70% of my exam on Course Hero. And, you know, it, it, it felt a little sleazy for sure, <laughs> but it was basically, you know, I, I, I don't want to, make students, um, I don't want to give them anxiety when it's not necessary. So I post my materials to this, play, this place uh, as a precaution. 70% of the exam is on there. There'll be some stuff that they don't know, but it's in, in hopes that it will uh, help them study, help them feel more comfortable, which is something I think we can all get behind. But the fact that Course Hero is actively, seems like forcing the point, um, well, it feels like they're using that as cover for the rest of their operation, basically. Yeah, and it isn't to say you can't do something like that. And, you know, there's there's ways to create assessments that I think reduce that anxiety, make it more applicable to your objectives, all these great things that you don't even have to involve Course Hero in. So they are appealing to faculty. They are marketing to faculty quite heavily, taking an alternate approach to CHEG. Um, but still predatory. Um, so what's next? We want to yeah. look at uh, getting your stuff off of Course Hero? Yes, I think that's the next step. So um, the process with Course Hero, so let's say I'm trying to find this mod module for assignment one. For Course Hero, we have to find the actual URL that it's associated with. Um, same with Chegg. Chegg's so quite a bit more difficult to find those. Um, but if I go in, you know, I can search by resource, I can search by classes. But I think the easiest place is to go by school. And this is, you know, an instructor not knowing what where their materials might be. This is how I would do it. So find study resources by school, search for a school. I'll go for Spokane Falls since that's the one I added that course to. And this is another element that um, is a little troubling. Most popular documents. These are materials that students have uploaded. Um, 
And here are the most popular departments for uh, uploading materials. But I can look at all departments. I could find my department and go through and find the courses that I teach. Um, or say, you know, I know I teach education. Let's just jump in there. And oh, here's my education 600. I jump in, there's that module, whatever assignment, for example. I click in, and now from here, of course here doesn't give us any quick way to, to find anything. And this flag looks a little new, but I have no idea what it does. So I've been going with the potentially more complex route, but one that's uh, a little bit easier um, or more reliable, I should say. So here's the assignment that I want to get out of here. I'm going to copy this URL. I'm going to go down. I'm going to go to our copyright policy. And in our copyright policy, submit takedown request. This was not always a streamlined, from my understanding. In the past, you had to, to hidden, deeply hidden. And you had by to, design. I think, use your own form, which I don't know about you, but I do not know how to submit a DMCA takedown request right. or even write one. Yeah. So the fact there must have been some pressure around this that caused this to happen. You also see that there's these learn the basics of copyright and things kind of. But the CYA stuff again, yeah. I think. Um, and there are actually some things that I want to talk about in the FAQs after a moment. But anyway, submit takedown request. All right. So we go through and it tells me a little bit of stuff. Um, of course, here are kind of covering their assets. And then I submit that post. And there are two options. So if something has your name on it, if it's your student, student paper that yeah. got submitted by one of your buddies, exactly. like it was a group project or something, and you didn't want your material online for good reason, probably. Yeah. And actually, in that case, you would definitely do the copyrighted work. Oh, okay. Um, has violated my privacy by posting personal information, be oh. like an image or your name oh, okay. or that kind of thing. I see. I see. Um, so I think this is going to be most of the cases. Start the request form. And now here's all of the stuff for the DMCA. There's that URL. So that hey, Nick, for... Yeah, can what's I up? Quick question. Is this the process for every assignment that you see posted up there? Every single one. You have to do an individual request. Well, then there's a button there that says add another work. So you could file multiple oh, requests I'm sorry. at a time. You are right. I but apologize. you still have to list every individual item with a direct link to each one. Yes. And let's do something just to compare. So for Chegg, the way I get to it is Chegg, take down request. It's the first one or should be the first one that pops up. And then for this one, it looks like they also do that. So you do have the opportunity, but you have to find every single freaking one and yeah. pull them and they don't make it easy, right? Their model is to make sure it's not easy. And it's purely a reactive process. You have to wait for one of your materials to be posted, and then you need to be aware of that, find it, and then file the request. Yeah, and I don't think anybody likes the idea of a workflow where after every term, you go through- Gotta go and find out what of my stuff is online again. Yeah. And you know that unfortunately, if there are a lot of materials up there, that is the case, unless you're cycling mm -hmm. materials in and out, but even then, you know, it's a lot of work. Um, and this is just this contact information that is for the legal claim that you are making. Uh, you're checking boxes to ensure that you are the person you say you are. So, okay, we've submitted a, a copyright infringement at Course Hero at Chegg. We had to find the resources first. Chegg, same deal. Uh, when it comes to Chegg, let us know if you do need help just sifting through. I want to offer that because it is so freaking difficult to find things in that space. It can be very hidden. And you, because things are behind walls, it can actually be really difficult to even determine if it is, in fact, one of your materials. Um, yes, and Jennifer is uh, keying at something that is uh, actually a little bit, well, it's really problematic. So 
Course Hero will then respond to say they have to alert the owner first. After owner. you have submitted the takedown request, it'll say, okay, we're, we're going we've to- We've made this claim. We're going to go look into it. And this, when they say owner, they mean the person uploading the document. Yeah. yeah. Um, then, so if Ooh. I remember, let's see, there's in our copyright FAQs, let me do this. Uh, if I'm a student and say I've gotten that communication that one of my materials has been taken down, what if I receive a takedown notice? Um, okay, so may provide the content provider slash uploader with notice of the removal of or disabled access to content. That's if they repeatedly post others' work. So we don't know what that... Um, what the threshold is. Yeah, what that threshold is. Okay. How do I file a counter notification? What is that? <laughs> So this is what I was looking through. And, you know, this isn't to say I have a fix for this for obvious reasons, but what's happening here is you can, as a student, counter the takedown notification. And what that does is from my understanding of this information, it starts a actual legal dispute. I, I don't know the correct terminology, but you would actually have to go to court to finish this process if it continued. Um, you know, Course Hero is going to help that student potentially fight it. And the thing to note about this, let's see if I can find, um, oh, where is it? There is a specific part of this and it might not even be in this yeah, FAQ. I'm that third right there, provide a statement on our Ah, here's yeah. the one that I was like, oh, geez. Please provide a statement under penalty of perjury that you have good faith belief that the material was mistakenly removed. Um, anytime I see a perjury uh, or legalese, what that makes me think is that what Course Hero has done is they've removed themselves. They're just a third party creating the interaction. The student could now be, you know, legally on the hook for yes. this counterclaim for this dmca suit and i don't know any student that would have gone like i don't want to make an assumption mm -hmm. but if a student isn't most times going to read a syllabus i doubt they're going to go through course hero and literally come through and look at the actual legal implications yeah uh if we go to their terms of use there is all sorts of stuff in here that is completely I mean, a student should be well aware of what is going on here. They need to know that they are not protected from academic uh, dishonesty claims. Course Hero is not responsible for anything like that. Um, all like, I mean, this is probably one of the longest terms of use I've seen on a site like this. Yeah. Um, but the thing that just really scares me about this is the potential for a student to first upload a course document, an instructor to find it and file a takedown notice, and the student to file a counter notice against the instructor, potentially opening themselves up to copyright infringement or perjury charges yeah. legally. Yeah. Like a student could very unwittingly get themselves into major legal trouble through this process. Mm -hmm. And that is, is incredibly dangerous and scary to me. And it just seems that there is no real oversight because of the way that Course Hero has developed these terms of use. Um, and that kind of, I, I, I don't want to be doom and gloom for obvious reasons, but it, it definitely solidifies the fact for me that, I mean, there's not a lot that we can do to combat this other than being reactive. Mm -hmm. The only proactive elements that I would even be able to consider would be like, Authentic assessment. We've got our module in fact dev on that. That only goes so far, but doing, you know, multimodal assessments, um, doing things with video, doing things that you can't just ship away to some resource yeah. or recreate. Yeah. I mean, and then there's elements of tilting assignments, providing really good criteria, showing exemplar cases. Scaffolding the assignment assignments. ahead of time because uh, we know from a lot of research and survey data that one of the big reasons students will cheat in the first place is anxiety over time management. They waited too long. They weren't paying attention. They 
got close to deadlines and they panic. And then they find these sites which are designed to prey on that panic and it leads them down that path. And, you know, I'm not taking the student agency out of it. The students are making those choices, but the system is designed to lead them there. Um, so yeah, you mentioned um, authentic assessment, which is a, a very big and complicated topic, which we do not have time to delve into right now. Mm. But the idea is finding ways to design assignments, like you said, that are more interactive or more personalized or involve uh, creating something rather than just answering questions. Mm. Uh, I'm going to, in the Zoom chat, I'm going to post a link, which is a direct link to a um, training module in our faculty development course about authentic assessment. I'll also put that link in, well, I won't put it in the YouTube channel because that's public. It, it wouldn't be publicly accessible that way. Um, but if you are watching this video on YouTube later, yeah. get a hold of us, I'll send you the link and we can sit down and we'd be happy to sit down and look at specific assignments that you're worried about and see if there are ways that we can help redesign or modify those assignments in a way that is harder to cheat on in the first place, mm -hmm. but also less likely for students to get stuck in that anxiety trap where they choose to cheat or they go down this path yeah. in the first place. And I, I want to be cognizant of time. We're at a uh, half an hour after, um, but I do want to just quickly plug in what Linda has said. Contractually, the college owns our work, but I think they turn the other cheek. If you include a statement that your assignments and other curriculum that you create is labeled CC, B, Y, and C. So that's a Creative Commons license. And maybe just to build on that and uh, kind of think of it concretely, putting in your syllabus, hey, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do these things. This is why I'm not a fan of these sites. Obviously, maybe fan isn't the right word. Um, <laughs> I hate these things. Uh, <laughs> maybe, uh, you know, including a statement in your syllabus, my materials are meant for the individuals in this class, in this term, and as such are specific to them. I design them specifically to you all. Please do not share these out. I will consider that X, Y, Z. And, you know, for in, in uh, instances where, say, as Jennifer has said, you know, um, having to uh, file student inc incident reports as soon as possible, you know, that's another element that you have in your favor then, like, hey, you know, it's in my syllabus. We always think of it as our contract with our students and as such kind of explaining why they should not be doing this in the first place can also help you later on. So I think that's pretty much everything we wanted to cover in half an hour. You made it. Nick. I, Great job. I, that I was a lot. Grand I mean, plans. Fantastically. Um, but we still have time. If you, if you have to go because your schedule it tells you, you have to go, you are, We'll see you later. Um, but I think we still have, I'm still got time to chat yep. if we want to I'd have any questions, any further, yeah. anecdotes or personal experiences about something like this you have had to deal with. I know that uh, Jennifer has. I don't know if Jennifer wants to share that story or not. No, no pressure either way. <laughs> I'm sure everybody here has kind of an experience that they can share, unfortunately. Here, I'll stop sharing so we can all see each other's faces. You know, one, one thought that came to mind during the session, and thanks, gentlemen, for putting it together. Um, you know, what, what becomes academic dishonesty when students are lured into this behavior, when they think they're doing right? Um, you know, what that, how's that concept change what we traditionally have thought? You know, when we're, we're thinking about students that are, are intentionally making the choices to cheat. Now they're getting the, you know, the notes from their friend who had the class, the section before. What does that mean now when a student's doing their academic research and they're just uninformed? Yeah. Well, and especially with a lot of this stuff just turning up in search results. Oh, I was just looking for, you know. Study oh, tips. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out the Krebs yeah, yeah. cycle. And all of a sudden now I've got somebody's exam that I'm studying off without even realizing mm -hmm. it. Like it. I could see that slope being so quick to fall through. Yep. Yeah, and I would just say, I want to jump in there. I, I would say that um, this presentation you guys just did today, which thanks so much for doing this. I, I think this is sort of modeling a conversation that we as faculty can and should have with our students. Um, you know, these to, to let them know, not only do we know about these sites, but we've explored them enough to recognize that they are really um, 
misleadingly constructed and that you could easily get into trouble that you didn't want to have any part of. So, so please, I guess, you know, something I always had in my syllabus long before I ever knew about the existence of any of these sites was something to the effect of, if you need help with an assignment, let me know, come talk to me. Um, because I know about resources that are available to you that in many cases you're already paying for the campus resources that are available to you. And I can help you find resources that will help that. And then in this context, that will help you avoid getting sucked into any of these traps that are being laid for you out there on the web. So, I mean, it's a, it's a relationship thing, but, um, but a, a, tr a transparency thing too. Like I know these are there. But talk to me. I'm I'm more helpful to you than Course Hero or Chegg. That's a really great point, Jared. Yeah. Just just yeah. Just letting them know I know how these work. And I I don't like them both because I don't want you to cheat, but also because I know that the danger <laughs> I know the danger that you can put yourself in by using these services. And like you said, then it becomes a trust building relational conversation rather than just a policing conversation, which is sometimes kind of that's as far as we take conversations about cheating is that policing level of I'm going to catch you. But now we're saying, well, no, it's bigger than that. It's not just about me catching you. It's about me helping you protect yourself in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. Yeah, it's building that trust. I love that. And something that comes to mind and from my previous experiences teaching, it's like, I remember a specific instance where I became extremely bitter because I found out somebody had cheated on an exam that I spent three hours freaking yeah. proctoring yeah. and, you know, I'd been designing it for days and yep. it was really hard. And then I talked to the student and, oh, you know, they were just right at the cusp of passing. They didn't want to leave anything to chance. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you just talk to me, like, we could have last week situation. we could have yeah. you know set up study sessions we could have found you a tutor you know there's those well that's those a, things that you can do you make a good point though nick about how did that how that affects your mindset as the teacher um when you when i'm grading a paper and i find out that i realize that a student plagiarized something i have to force myself to stop grading for a while because then it puts me in a bad mood and now i'm super yeah. critical of all of the papers not just the one that i found that was plagiarizing like it 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 just like you said it makes you bitter oh, yeah. and then that bitterness bleeds out into all of your student experiences and interactions and oh. it just becomes poisonous yeah i mean if i don't if i'm grading on an empty stomach that influences grades by it oh yeah a yeah. ton so if never, i'm mad never like, grade, don't, don't grade hangry don't grade hangry <laughs> that's a whole nother element <laughs> All right, well, that, that's probably about it for today. I think that was a good conversation. We don't have any silver bullets because there aren't any silver bullets for this. You know, nuanced. That's, yeah. It's nuanced and as Jared kind of suggested, a lot of the solutions are relational, not technological. So, you know, if you have any questions, if you have any concerns, if you want some help investigating these things and, and dealing with them, come talk to us and we can help with that process. Yeah. Otherwise, I think we're gonna call it a day. Uh, again, no tech talks next week, even though we had it on the calendar because we know nobody's gonna be here. We will see you again in April. All right, I'm gonna close our YouTube stream. That's a great idea.